Now I'm thinking about Kevin Hall's ultra processed versus unprocessed study that he did. And I'm intrigued how you kind of make sense of the findings. You know, my understanding of that study was we're comparing two diets, one that's ultra processed, one that's unprocessed, but we're going to match for carbohydrates, for fat, for protein, for fiber, and sodium. But even then, still, when eating the ultra-processed diet, people were consuming more calories. So was it palatability? Was it eating rate? Was it energy density? What, what do you think kind of explained the results from that study? Yeah, so so the results were really interesting because they were pretty compelling. Like the, the participants consumed like 500 calories a day more. Um, so pretty substantial relative to the the unprocessed diet. Um, and um, I thought it was it was really interesting because yes, they matched on a whole bunch of those those um, nutrients that you mentioned. Um, but that was at the overall dietary level and didn't really account for the nutrients that may occur within this within a food or within a meal. Um, that was served to participants that may have um, played a role there. And so um, my hypothesis was that hi the hyper palatability of the meals may have been one factor that could have, um, you know, played a role in the, you know, the observed findings where participants consumed about, you know, 500 calories more. Um, and so that was part of when I published the definition um, and Kevin and I had some initial correspondence <laughs> about the premise of being able to test this hypothesis using his data. Um, he was originally skeptical because he was like, well, but we assessed palatability like sub like subjectively rated by participants and there were no kind of overall average differences how do you do that you ask someone like out of 10 how satisfied yes i believe it was some like yeah like visual analog scale zero to ten um and so he said you know we didn't find any um overall differences across the diet so he was like i i I'm skeptical, but but we could we could look at this, um, and so that was kind of the the starting point for some for our collaboration on the study that um, that I mentioned uh, um, you know earlier when we were talking that combined this ultra processed food data with another trial that he did as well, and so within that we found um, that um, the hyper palatability of the meal served to participants. Um, was one of the strongest drivers of their intake at that meal. Um, and so that was, and, and that was viewed really across the diets. And we also, um, and we also considered energy density, which was at that time, um, one of the main criticisms of like their findings that they didn't control for energy density across the diet. So people thought like, oh, well, it's probably just that. Um, and so what we did in, in when we analyzed the data was that we looked at whether um, basically the two hyperpalatability and the energy density were basically doing the same kind of having similar and kind of overlapping effects um, to promote greater consumption. And what we found was interesting because they they weren't kind of just synonymous within themselves. Like there was a distinct role of hyper palatability in promoting greater energy intake within the meal. And then there was also a distinct role of the energy density. Um, so even when kind of we put them in like a statistical model and we can basically think of like letting them duke it, duke it out, you know, and like whoever still comes out with like, you know, enough kind of predictive, um, um, you know, uh, utility for understanding, um, energy intake within that meal would result as being like a significant predictor, right? Um, but the interesting thing was that they both did, and they had some interesting effects where if the hyper palatability of the meal was much, um, was pretty high, the effects of the energy density of the meal were kind of less strong and vice versa. So they really had like interesting, interesting. nuanced effects. Um, to, so, th so there was quite a bit going on with that and, and it was really kind of, you know, it was like, oh, we're just kind of touching the surface here. Right. Asking people how satisfied they are with a meal 
and then using that to determine palatability, that assumes that you can assess this subjectively, that hyperpalatable foods will definitively result in someone saying I'm more satisfied with that. But what happens if those hyperpalatable foods are affecting energy intake at a more subconscious level? I'm glad you asked this because this circles us back to kind of the point that we were talking about earlier between like wanting versus liking and kind of the drive to consume these foods versus just like the subjective experience of eating these foods, which would be like the you know, the pleasantness or the, the you know, hi- the palatability. Um, I think the, the premise of like the hyper palatability gets at um, that these foods affect the wanting. They affect the drive um, to consume them, which is distinct from the subjective individual level response of like how pleasant is it to consume these. Mm-hmm.